Yes, uh, welcome also from my side. And uh, I also want to thank the organizers uh, for setting everything up and uh, for inviting us. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with a lecture about uh, groups, representations, and equivariant maps. And uh, why do we need uh, group theory if uh, we want to do geometric deep learning? Um, the reason is that uh, many geometric structures are modeled by groups. So um, we first need to understand groups to, to understand uh, geometric deep learning. And I'm uh, applying groups in my own research. Uh, with, I, I did a PhD with Max Welding and Taco Cohen. And uh, we are working on equivariant neural networks. And um, yeah, um, I try to keep everything very visual and uh, intuitive. Um, but uh, group theory is uh, inherently abstract. So um, please uh, ask questions or, or um, yeah, um, speak up if, if I'm going too fast or so. All right, so um, what is a symmetry group? Um, you can think about it as uh, the set of transformations uh, that leave some object uh, invariant. So for instance, if you have this uh, butterfly on the top left, um, then uh, it's invariant under reflections and uh, reflections are a symmetry group. Uh, if you have the other butterfly uh, on the right, then uh, this one is asymmetric. So you have a trivial symmetry group in that uh, case. Um, then we will also look at uh, symmetries of manifolds or isometries in particular. Um, you can think about symmetries of graphs. So um, for this graph here, for instance, uh, flipping the third and the fourth node would be a symmetry, but uh, exchanging other nodes would not be a symmetry since um, then, uh, yeah, let's let's say uh, node one and node two, they have a different neighborhood. So um, they, they are structurally not equivalent. Um, and it also plays a big role in physics. Uh, for instance, if you have a crystal lattice, then you have uh, discrete translational symmetries. Um, or uh, if you look at this uh, rotational symmetric uh, potential that plays a big role in physics as well, uh, it would imply that you have angular momentum conservation. If you have a group that's uh, kind of an abstract uh, set of, of um, elements, um, but one given group can act on different other uh, objects or spaces. So um, for instance, uh, the uh, rotation group SO2 in two dimensions uh, could act on R2 and rotate vectors in the plane, or it could also act on a sphere by rotating it uh, around different axes, um, or you could uh, even rotate something like an image or a scalar field on the plane, um, or something like a vector field. So the point I want to make here is that one given group can act on different spaces. And uh, then uh, I will also talk about group representations, and representations are linear group actions on vector spaces. And uh, we're interested in group representations, since um, if we are doing deep learning, we usually have uh, feature vector spaces, and then uh, we look at linear group actions. And finally, we will have a look at uh, invariant and equivariant functions. So these, these terms apply to functions. And um, two very uh, canonical examples are um, image classification or image segmentation. Uh, and in the case of image classification, um, you want that uh, this classifier says uh, this is a bedroom and it should say it's a bedroom independent from how you shift around that image. So uh, that task should be translation or shift invariant. And uh, this is visualized by this commutative diagram here, which says if you take your image and you shift it and then classify, it should be the same as immediately classifying it. And uh, having a commutative diagram uh, kind of means that if you go along different arrows, to the, uh, from the same start to end node, then uh, you want that um, the result is always the same. So this is how you should interpret these commutative diagrams, which will pop up sometimes. Um, and that is invariance, where you have a group action on your input. But um, if you have an equivariant uh, task, then you also have a group action on the output. So if you do segmentation, uh, then you want to have this property that um, if you have a shifted image, then the segmentation mask should be um, the same as first segmenting the image and then shifting it. So here we want that um, our group action commutes uh, with the function that is equivariant. All right, so um, I will first talk a little bit about the basics of uh, group theory, introduce what a group is and so on. Um, then we will have a look at uh, group actions. Then uh, I will come to invariant and equivariant maps and uh, finally group representation theory. And uh, later we will have a talk uh, by Chris. Uh, he will introduce some basic topology. And then uh, I will give a talk again about uh, manifolds and a little bit of fiber bundles. 
And uh, Pim will also talk about uh, category theory, he just told me. Okay, um, I want to introduce the group uh, with some examples, uh, visual examples. Um, here in the case of a rotation group, SO2, in two dimensions. And um, a group is always a set of elements. Um, for instance, here we would have uh, the set of all rotations from 0 to 2 pi. And we can take two rotations or elements of the set and compose them. And then we get a new um, element from the set, a new rotation. And uh, this composition has to uh, satisfy certain properties. Uh, the first one is um, there has to be an identity element in your group. So uh, for, for the rotation, that would be um, the rotation by zero degrees. And then if you have any rotation and you compose it with a rotation by zero degrees, then uh, you will get out uh, the same element again. Uh, then we need an inverse element, which is uh, if you are rotating forward, the inverse is just rotating backwards. And uh, these two elements uh, just cancel out. This is when they are called inverses. And uh, finally, we have that um, the composition of uh, group elements is associative, so it doesn't matter in which order you um, compose them or like how you put the brackets there. Yeah. Is the reason why you take only uh, the term matrix or? Um, that's, that's just a visual example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so SO2 are uh, two by two matrices which have uh, determinant plus one and uh, they are orthogonal. Uh, but yeah, if, if you would have uh, plus one or minus one, then uh, you would also have reflections, or you could look at something like uh, scaling or shearing on the general linear group. So that's that's just a visual example, which which I'm talking about here as an intuition. Um, but we can go now and and uh, look at the abstract definition of a symmetry group. Uh, and what we have there is uh, well again a set of group elements, and uh, we call that set G. And uh, we have a binary operation, which takes uh, two group elements and gives you again a group element. So it maps from G times G to G. And um, it has to, so this composition has to, or the binary operation has to satisfy three axioms. Uh, the first one is associativity, which I told you already. Then the identity element uh, should exist. So there should be an element in G, which we always write E, such that uh, for all group elements which you can take, the composition of that group element with the trivial group element from the left or from the right uh, should give the group element again. So it, it just does nothing. It's like the rotation by zero degrees. And uh, we also need an inverse for each group element. So uh, for all G in the group, uh, there needs to exist a G inverse in the group, such that if you compose them again from the left or from the right, uh, it should cancel out and give you the uh, identity element. Uh, so for instance, uh, rotating forward by uh, 45 degrees uh, and then rotating backwards again gives you the uh, zero degree rotation. And if you have a set with a binary operation and these uh, properties, then uh, you have a group, a symmetry group. This is how it is formalized. And we can look at some examples. Um, for instance, if you take uh, the translation group in D dimensions, uh, you have as a set, you have uh, RD, D dimensional vectors. And uh, as the binary operation, um, you would have uh, summation. And um, yeah, we actually have to check uh, the group axioms and uh, closure means uh, that if we compose two elements from G, that indeed we get an element from G again. Uh, we have to check that. Uh, I will shortly do that here at the blackboard. And uh, if someone there from the corner can't see it, uh, maybe you can come around for that. Um, yeah, so for, for the translation group, we basically have this map plus as binary operation, which maps from RD times rd to rd so that is satisfied and this is uh yeah it's it's closed our set here is closed under this uh, operation um then associativity uh, holds for summation uh, this is something we know um then we need an inverse element so if we have uh, x in rd so for all x in rd uh, we have the element minus x in RD, and uh, then if we compose them, so X plus minus X is zero, and uh, this zero, summing by zero, that's the uh, identity element. So uh, this uh, satisfies obviously the uh, group axioms, so uh, the translation group is indeed a group. Um, then as a second example, uh, we're looking at the unitary group, U1, um, which is uh, the set of all 
complex numbers uh, with uh, norm one. So we have our complex plane. C, and then all numbers uh, with norm one. And uh, the composition of group elements, I didn't actually write it there, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just a multiplication of complex numbers. And um, we could take two complex numbers here, and if we multiply them, then uh, this is just a rotation on this circle here, so you get somewhere else and you get a new number on this circle. And this uh, complex multiplication is again, uh, or, or the circle is closed under uh, complex multiplication, and um, yeah, associativity holds for, uh, for multiplication of complex numbers. Uh, we have an identity element, which is multiplication by one, which is in this circle. That's the multiplication with this element here. And then uh, for each group element, let's say for this one here, we have an inverse group element, which is here. If you multiply these two, you get here to the uh, identity element. So this is also a group. Um, yeah, then another example is the uh, general linear group, uh, GLD in D dimensions, and these are just D by D matrices, um, and the composition is matrix multiplication. And uh, in addition, we demand that uh, the determinant of these matrices is uh, different from zero. And uh, again, we have uh, that closure holds, um, associativity holds uh, for the composition of, uh, yeah, if, if you multiply matrices, um, we have an identity element, um, which is just the identity matrix. And uh, then the inverse element uh, is the inverse matrix. Um, and usually not every matrix has an inverse, but um, matrices with determinant, which is not equal to zero, do have an inverse. And this is where this uh, property comes from, or this, this constraint that in the general linear group, you have all matrices uh, which have a determinant, which is different from zero. And then finally, uh, we would have the trivial group as an example, which just has one element, uh, which is the identity. Um, and then, yeah, trivially also all these properties are satisfied. So it's its own um, own inverse and um, yeah, the identity element is in there. And uh, I want to give some uh, counter examples. <clears throat> For instance, uh, if you have, again, uh, unit norm complex numbers, but only uh, going here, in polar coordinates uh, from, from zero to pi. Then the problem is uh, that this here does not form a group since um, it's not closed under multiplication. So this, this set together with uh, complex multiplication. Since if you have, uh, let's say, well, if, if you have this guy here and this point, it would multiply somewhere over here. So there it's closed. But if you take uh, two elements uh, which are lying here, you would end up somewhere down here and uh, you don't have closure. So uh, we don't have that G times G is being mapped into G again. So that's not a group. Um, then uh, as a second example, we could look at uh, D, by D matrices uh, with determinant two, and that's again not closed since if you multiply two of these matrices, you get out a matrix which has determinant four, again, no closure. And uh, as a third counter example, if you take all D by D matrices, uh, you don't have an inverse since not any matrix is invertible. Okay, and um, if you are reading or learning about group theory, then uh, you have to pay attention um, in which category of groups uh, you're working. So usually um, in, in the book, it says something like, okay, we are considering finite groups or topological groups, compact groups, uh, Lie groups or so. And um, what this means is uh, then you are assuming additional structure on the group. So um, if you have a topological group, then uh, you have a topology on the group, which uh, Chris will explain later on what that means. And um, the binary operation has to be has to respect the topology in that case, and then uh, you're looking at continuous maps. Um, if you have a Lie group, then uh, your group is a smooth manifold in addition, and you're looking at smooth maps. Or if you have a finite group, uh, that's not really a structure, but um, yeah, you would have a finite set. Your group is a finite set. It's nothing continuous like continuous rotations, um, and the binary operation would in that case be any function between finite sets. Okay, um, now we can look at uh, specific properties of groups. Um, for instance, an abelian group. Um, yeah, the point here is uh, that uh, group elements do in general not commute. So we had as examples uh, some matrix groups like the general linear group, and you know that uh, matrix multiplication does not commute. So GH is in general something different than HG. That is one example in matrix groups. Or another example would be uh, the group O2 of uh, reflections and rotations. And uh, you see visually that if you first uh, reflect this lizard and then you rotate it, 
uh, you get something different than if you first rotate it with the same rotation and then reflect also horizontally. Um, but yeah, in interchanging these two operations uh, does not commute. You get a different result out. So groups are in general not uh, commutative. Um, but if they are, there, there are certain groups which are, and uh, they're called abelian groups. So you call a group abelian if for any pair G and H uh, of, of uh, group elements in your group, you have that GH is the same as HG. And um, yeah, as an example, we can look at uh, first three-dimensional rotations. So let's say I take this bottle here and I rotate it uh, around the axis from me to you by 90 degrees, and then I rotate around the Z axis. The bottle is pointing towards me. But uh, if we do the same two operations in the other order, so first I rotate around the Z axis, and then around the axis from me to you, uh, it points to the left. So you see that 3D rotations uh, do not commute with each other. But uh, we could look at the subgroup of rotations around the Z axis only. So let's do it like this. Uh, these, these two basically commute with each other. It doesn't matter whether you first rotate by 90 degrees and then 45, or first 45 and then 90 degrees. So SO3, the three-dimensional rotation group, is uh, not an abelian group, but SO2 is an abelian group. OK, so then uh, I want to introduce the notion of a subgroup. Um, and a subgroup is uh, basically a subset of, the, of group elements, uh, which still forms a group. Um, so for instance, these uh, SO2 rotations uh, would be a subgroup of SO3 rotations. Um, and yeah, formally, um, if, if you have a group uh, G, then uh, we're looking at a subset H of G. And uh, if we have this round bracket here, it just says subset, and it's a subgroup. Or if it's a subgroup, we have this uh, smaller equal sign here. And um, yeah, a subset uh, is guaranteed to be a group as well, a subgroup, if um, uh, the subset is uh, closed under composition and taking inverses. So um, composition means uh, if for all two group elements, we have that um, if we combine them, they are still uh, in the same subgroup. And that was actually that was this example here, where we had uh, this full circle. And then we looked at a subset, um, but this subset is not closed anymore under the oper uh, binary operation. So because of that, it's not a subgroup, but it's just a subset. Um, yeah, and then inversion, uh, you also need uh, inverse elements, and that would also not hold here. Um, the inverse of that uh, point here is this point down here, and it's again not in our set. But if you have uh, that a subset, uh, yeah, um, is closed under composition and uh, under inversion, then you can actually prove that the group axioms hold, and then this uh, subset is also a subgroup. And uh, yeah, some examples. Um, if you have the continuous translation groups, then a subgroup would be uh, translations by uh, yeah, discrete steps. Um, and yeah, instead of having RD with uh, summation, you could look at uh, ZD, which is like a discrete pixel grid. Um, then uh, I already said, uh, if you have SO3, a subgroup uh, is SO2, rotations around one fixed axis. Um, and then we have the trivial examples that uh, every group G has the, sub the trivial subgroup, if you just take the identity element. Uh, and every group G has itself as a subgroup. But that's a trivial example. And uh, yeah, I already gave that first counter example. Um, the second example uh, is the um, translation group in one dimension, where you have the real line. And uh, this with uh, summation is a translation group, as I explained in the beginning. But uh, if we now take only the positive numbers, so only this part here, then this is actually um, closed under composition. Since if we sum these two points, we get a point here. But it's not closed under inversion. So it also does not form a subgroup. OK, so um, you can take a group and build a subgroup, a smaller group out of it. But you can also build bigger groups out of groups. Um, and in particular, you can do that uh, by taking products of two different groups. So um, there, there are different product operations. Uh, the most simple one is the direct product of groups. So uh, let's say we have uh, two groups, H and K. Um, and then their uh, direct product is just the, uh, the, um, so the set which you have is the Cartesian product of these sets. So you're looking at pairs of group elements. 
uh, if you have a group element, um, yeah, some, some group element H uh, from your group H and a group element K from your group K, then uh, a group element from the direct product group is a pair of this H and K. And um, the uh, binary operation which you put on that uh, structure, on this product, is a map from H times K to H times K, and it just composes these two things independently from each other. So that's really very simple. You, you have two groups which, which are composed into a bigger direct product group, but they, um, they transform independently from each other, or they compose independently. And an example is uh, the symmetry group of a cylinder, uh, which composes of uh, rotations, SO2 rotations and translations around the cylinder. And um, if, if you have such an operation, um, then like the rotations and the translations, they are completely independent from each other. But uh, we can look at a different example, which is uh, the special Euclidean group in two dimensions. Um, and that is actually not a direct product, but something which is called a semi-direct product. And um, yeah, this is uh, what, what I try to, I, I don't give you the full uh, abstract definition since um, it's, it's a bit technical and I have to introduce uh, group homomorphisms first. But I think this uh, example here visualizes it in a quite nice way. So um, if, if you have your uh, Euclidean space R2 on that picture, then uh, you have different symmetries. And uh, we look here at translations and rotations of R2. Um, but these translations and rotations are not independent, since um, if you translate this lizard here to the right, and then you rotate this thing, um, yeah, you get this uh, picture on the very right. Um, but you see that, um, yeah, this translation would be, let's say, a translation by uh, one step in the x direction. So uh, you have this group element one zero, and here we have a rotation by zero degrees just for simplicity. And then here we don't apply any translation, but a rotation. Uh, then what comes out is actually um, a translation in uh, the y direction and a rotation of the lizard. So the lizard was here shifted uh, in x direction, but it ends up being shifted in y direction, right? And um, you can write that as, so this translation in y direction and 90 degree rotation of the lizard around its own axis as uh, this 90 degree rotation that is not being affected, but the translation is being acted on by the rotation. So um, a bit more abstractly, uh, we, we have this product of groups H and K, and um, the second group K, uh, which in our example would be rotations, acts on the first group as well, on the translations. And then you call it the semi-direct product. Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, just sit down if you have time uh, at some point and, and look at the uh, definition uh, I can't go into more details here, but um, I just wanted to mention it. Um, then I have to introduce uh, group homomorphisms, and uh, these are uh, kind of structure-preserving uh, functions between different groups. Um, yeah, so uh, we, are, we, we have two groups, uh, G and G prime, um, and uh, you have a group homomorphism if uh, it's, it's a map gamma from G to G prime, uh, and it has to satisfy this uh, relation here that uh, gamma of the composition of two elements in your uh, in your domain, uh, so in the group G, is the same as first mapping them independently over via gamma, and then composing them in the uh, codomain group. And uh, this is what is shown here on this uh, in this commutative diagram. So uh, if we have two elements here in G times G, we can compose them and map them over via gamma to get one uh, group element in G prime, or we can map these two guys here independently to G prime times G prime, and then compose them here, and we get something in G prime. And um, if this uh, commutative diagram is satisfied, uh, this map gamma is a group homomorphism. And um, you can prove that this implies that uh, gamma of G inverse is gamma of, so uh, first taking the inverse and then applying gamma is the same as first applying gamma and then inverting the group element. Um, and uh, it also implies that uh, mapping the, that the identity in G is being mapped to the identity in G prime. And in this sense, the group structure, the group composition law is uh, respected by uh, this group homomorphism. And you can have uh, homomorphisms in different categories. Uh, like if, if you map other things like, um, I don't know, vector spaces or so, and then you want that, uh, vector summation is being respected. So a homomorphism is always a map which respects the structure of uh, whatever is being mapped. 
and the structure of a group is this composition. So we want that the composition in the domain is uh, kind of commuting with this map. So that is being reflected by a composition in the co-domain. And um, we can look at an example here, uh, which is the complex exponentiation of the uh, translation group in one dimension. So we're mapping uh, the one dimension um, translation group to uh, U1. Uh, so we are mapping this, this uh, point X, renumbered to uh, the exponential of IX. And um, this is a group homomorphism, I claim. And uh, you can look at this diagram here to understand it. So if you have two elements, uh, X and Y, we can sum these elements and we get X plus Y. And then we can exponentiate it and we get E to the power I X plus Y. And uh, I forgot the brackets here. Um, or you can take these two elements here and map them independently. So X and Y are mapped to E to the I X, E to the I Y. And then we multiply it and when we get this product and uh, you know that these two things are the same. So this is a group homomorphism from the uh, translation group to um, this group U1. Um, but what you see is that um, this kind of loses some information since um, let's let's say uh, you, you would uh, go to something like pi then um, in, in the translation group, then uh, it's mapped to a rotation by pi in uh, U1. But uh, if you add multiples of two pi, this thing is periodic. It kind of wraps the real line around this unit circle. And um, yeah, you, you lose some information here. Um, and this brings us to group isomorphisms, uh, which are invertible group homomorphisms. And they really um, kind of identify two groups which are structurally completely equivalent. Um, and then we write that uh, G is it's, it's this equal sign with the wiggle on top uh, means it's isomorphic to G prime. And uh, I have some examples here again. Um, the group U1, which are these uh, complex uh, rotations in the complex plane, is isomorphic to the group SO2, which has these two by two rotation matrices. These are rotations of R2. Um, and this is again isomorphic to um, the subgroup of SO3, which rotates around the Z axis. And this is again isomorphic to the subgroup of uh, SO3, which rotates around any other axis, basically. So you see you have different group elements here, but um, we can uh, map them back and forth to each other. And then uh, these compositions, these two dimensional rotations, uh, are equivalent in these different spaces. And then we are saying that uh, these two or, or, or these groups are isomorphic. Okay, now I come to group actions, uh, but do you have questions until now? All right. Okay, um, if you have a symmetry group, uh, it can act on, um, on certain objects uh, or spaces or I don't know, something like a graph, whatever. Um, and a group action, so uh, if, if you want to formalize it, um, you, you need a group G and you need something to be acted on. And here we just take a set, which we call X. And uh, yeah, I'm defining a left group action. You can also define a right group action, but that's uh, very similar. So just ignore it. Uh, the group action is a map which takes a group element G and it takes uh, an element X from the set and it maps it again to an element X from the set. So it goes from G times X to X and uh, we write it as uh, taking G and X, and then I have G and this right triangle acting on X. And uh, a group action has to satisfy, again, certain properties. Um, the first one is associativity, which means that if you have two group elements, G and H, uh, and you compose them, so you act with G, H on X, it should be the same as first acting with H on X, and then acting with G on X, right? Uh, so. For instance, if we look here at this example of SO2 rotations, um, if we act on a point or on a vector in R2, then uh, it shouldn't matter. So if, if we have a rotation by 45 degrees and then one by 90 degrees, we can do this in two steps or we can in one step rotate by 135 degrees and it should be the same. So that is something a group action has to satisfy. And the second property is the identity, uh, which means that if you act with the identity element, uh, the group action has to preserve that element and not move it around. And uh, yeah, what I want to make clear is that groups can uh, act on 
different spaces or objects. For instance, uh, not only on vectors in R2, but uh, it could also act on an image. Um, then I want to introduce uh, group orbits. Um, the group orbit is uh, kind of like if, if you have this element here and uh, you act on it with G, you move it around here on this circle. And this circle uh, is the group orbit. This is why it is called an orbit. Um, but formally, uh, if we have an action triangle uh, of G on X, um, and we have some element X uh, of this set, then uh, the orbit is this subset of X, which we write capital G acting on X. And it consists just of all points in uh, all points in the set X, which uh, come out if you act with all group elements or with any group element of each other on X. So here in this example, we have our point X, and then we act with all rotations on X, and we get this whole orbit here out. And if you would have something like a discrete uh, rotation group, let's say just 90 degree rotations, our orbit would be this point, this point, this point, and this point. So it's just the uh, set of points which are being traced out if you act with your group on it. And uh, yeah, here you're seeing different orbits of different points. And um, yeah, for, for the next slide, um, I uh, want to say that um, the property or the relation that uh, if you say uh, two elements um, are on, on the same orbit, uh, this is an equivalence relation, uh, which means it satisfies these uh, three properties. Uh, the first one is reflexivity, uh, which just means that um, if, uh, yeah, that, that X is contained in its own orbit, so X is equivalent to X. Then symmetry means that uh, if X is equivalent to Y, Y is equivalent to X, uh, which kind of means that if you have a point X being on the orbit of Y, then also Y is on the orbit of X, right? And uh, the last one is transitivity. Um, so if X uh, is equivalent to Y and Y is equivalent to Z, then also X is equivalent to Z. Um, yeah, again, like it's obvious on the orbit, uh, like in, in this picture. Um, and if you have these three prop properties, then you have an equivalence relation. And always if you have an equivalence relation on a set, then uh, you can take a quotient with respect to this uh, equivalence relation and you get the quotient space out. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to show it visually down here. Um, the quotient space of this uh, original space or set X, which is R2 in our case, is uh, just the space of all orbits. So you, you kind of think about of, uh, yeah, you, you think about these orbits here as being points in, in a space. So you collapse them to one uh, point. And then if you look at the set of all orbits, uh, they kind of start here in the origin. Uh, this is where it starts, and then you can go out radially, and uh, this kind of goes through all orbits. So the quotient of uh, this two-dimensional space with respect to this rotational action is uh, kind of like this positive real line here, where I identify this central point here with this one down here. That's the orbit of zero. Then uh, the next orbit is here, and the next orbit is here, and this orbit of x, g acting on x, uh, is here. So um, yeah, if we have a group action, um, on a set X, then uh, we can always look at this space of orbits and uh, it's called quotient set. And uh, abstractly, uh, we write it as X and then we have the left group action of G, which is why we write it as a left quotient and it's just defined as the set of all orbits. And um, yeah, then we also have a quotient map which just goes from this space being acted on, which is our whole plane R2 uh, to the space of orbits or to this quotient space here. So it sends a point to its orbit. Uh, if you look down here, it sends this point X here to this orbit of X. This is our quotient map. Okay, and then uh, finally, I uh, need to introduce some properties, further properties of uh, group actions. Um, the first one is uh, a transitive action or the definition of a homogeneous space. And uh, you say that the G action on a space X is transitive if, uh, yeah, the abstract uh, definition is just if for each two points X and Y in your space, you find some group element which maps X into Y. So you find a group element which if you act with it on X, you get Y out. Um, for instance, if, if you have here uh, this, this um, plane R2, 
and you have the translation group, then for each two points, you find a translation which moves the first point into the second point. So the translation group action on uh, R2 is transitive. Um, if we look at another example here, rotations of the plane, this is not transitive. Since um, if let's say we, we take uh, the center here, uh, it doesn't move at all if we rotate around. So you cannot map it to any other point. So that's not a transitive group action. Um, and uh, if a group action on a space is transitive, uh, then you call this uh, space a homogeneous space of that group. So um, R2 is a homogeneous space of the translation group, but R2 is not a homogeneous space of the uh, rotation group. And then another example are reflections. Uh, that's again not transitive since, um, well, we can map points from here to here, but uh, not from, let's say, here to here. Um, if we have the sphere, uh, and SO3 as an action, rotations of the sphere, we can again map any point to any other point with a rotation. So it's a transitive action. And uh, the sphere is a homogeneous space of uh, SO3. But uh, if we look now again at the sub, uh, subgroup of rotations around the Z axis, then again, we cannot map any point to any other point. Only points uh, on, the same, uh, yeah, on the same orbit can be mapped to each other. Um, and if we have the cylinder and we look at uh, rotations and translations up and down, it would be a homogeneous space. But if we only look at uh, rotations, then again, we cannot map any point to any other point. So it would again not be a transitive action or homogeneous space. Um, and then uh, I also want to introduce uh, stabilizer subgroups. Um, so again, we are looking at uh, some set which is being acted on by a group G. And um, the stabilizer subgroup uh, of some element uh, X in this uh, set is uh, just the group of elements uh, which leave this, uh, the, so the, the set of group elements which leave this uh, element from the set invariant. Um, for instance, here, if you have rotations of your plane, the uh, stabilizer subgroup of the origin is SO2. Since if you rotate it, this central point is being stabilized. It doesn't move around. So SO2 is this stabilizer well, subgroup, but it's actually the full group which is also a subgroup, um, and all other points are not stabilized at all. Uh, here, if you have translations of your plane, uh, there's no stabilizer subgroup, right? Since uh, like there's no group element which uh, does not, or on, only the uh, identity element. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the trivial group is uh, always a stabilizer subgroup, but uh, it's a trivial example. Um, and there's no other group element which uh, fixes um, this point there. Uh, and then if we look at uh, reflections, the stabilizers here outside uh, are trivial again. There's no group element which leaves this point here since uh, reflections will move it over. But if you're on the reflection axis, then uh, these points will have a stabilizer subgroup, which are reflections. And um, then uh, if we are looking at SO3, uh, then uh, let's, let's think about the North Pole. Uh, this North Pole is uh, stabilized by all group elements, which are rotations around the Z axis. So the stabilizer subgroup of uh, the North Pole, uh, if you have an SO3 action, is the subgroup SO2 of rotations uh, around that point. And if you have uh, any, any other point, you have also some axis which goes uh, through the sphere and uh, some rotation around that axis, which is stabilizing this point. Um, if you have an SO2 action uh, on your sphere, then here at the poles, you have SO2 as stabilizer subgroup. And everywhere else, you don't have any stabilizer subgroup. And uh, yeah, here in this example, where we have our cylinder and rotations of the cylinder, then uh, our stabilizers are all trivial. And um, yeah, we are interested in uh, homogeneous spaces uh, since we can define convolutions on homogeneous spaces in a very general setting. And uh, we have a paper on that, or actually, uh, Taco Cohen was uh, mainly writing that. And there are now uh, many other papers. Uh, which define convolutional networks on homogeneous spaces. So you know convolutions, of course, on Euclidean spaces, but you could also define a convolution on a sphere, spherical CNNs. Uh, and with this theory, you can also define it on a cylinder or any other homogeneous space. But uh, with this theory, you cannot define convolutions on something like a Riemannian manifold. Uh, and I will later in this week talk about that. OK, questions so far? Come back at the yeah. Side.
take it, so the sphere in SEO so free, mm -hmm. uh, not all, uh, uh, what, what do you mean SEO, SEO2 in the, in this case, just rotation and uh, a long one access, yeah. But yeah. not all rotations are static, yeah, they're just uh, a rotation to pi radians, you know? Um, so if, if you have some points, let's say the North Pole, oh, okay, then, North Pole. But yeah, if it's not at the North Pole, uh, you, you could take, you to, could take any other point and then you have some axis, uh, and rotations around that axis are an SO3 and the oh, point is stabilized by that. The, 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 okay. Yeah. So but the, the pole in which the, 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 okay, the axis is for which this point is the pole. This is what you mean. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but, and, and, and so it means that the two S of two are different. Exactly. Yeah. So the, these are, so are different yeah, 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 yeah. of uh, stabilizer for each point. That are isomorphic. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These are isomorphic uh, subgroups, so they are both rotations around the axis, but it's a different axis, so you have different group elements. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you. And just to understand, transduction means that there is just one orbit. Yes, exactly. Exactly. If, if you have a transitive action, there's, yeah, any point can be moved everywhere, so you have only one orbit. And this orbit is a homogeneous space. So the quotient space is just a single. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I will come to invariant and equivariant maps. Now that we have uh, group actions defined. Um, yeah. Um, we already had these examples in the beginning. Um, now a bit more abstractly, uh, we have uh, some set X, and we have a group action uh, triangle subscript X on this uh, set X. And we have a function uh, which maps from X to Y. Um, then we call this function uh, G invariant, if uh, basically this here holds that L of uh, G acting on X is the same as L being applied to X only without this action. And uh, this is what you are seeing in this uh, top right diagram. So you have, uh, you have L, uh, no, sorry, uh, G first acting on X and then being mapped by L uh, to Y, that is the same as mapping immediately from X to Y. And if this holds, then uh, you call this, uh, this uh, function uh, G invariant. And an example would be uh, the norm of uh, the dimensional vectors, which is invariant under rotations, right? If you take a vector and you rotate it, then it norm, its norm does not change, so it's an invariant map. Um, then a uh, bit more pictorial, uh, you could look at uh, luggage classification. So uh, I was flying here and uh, my, check, my, my back was checked and uh, they wanted to see whether I have something like a dangerous object like this knife in there. And um, if there's a knife inside uh, the, the um, um, scanner should, should say, okay, there's something dangerous in it. Uh, and this should be independent from the permutation from the order of set elements. So this is, uh, uh, and permutation invariant map example. Um, then uh, if we do image classification, uh, we could demand that it is uh, invariant under, uh, let's say rotations, reflections, translations, and so on. So it would be an isometry invariant map. And um, actually invariant maps are uh, characterized by something which is called a universal property. And uh, yeah, one, one says that this invariant map descends to the quotient. Uh, which means that um, if you have a G invariant map, uh, which goes from X to Y, so L goes from X to Y and it's invariant, uh, then you have this quotient map, which goes from X to the orbit space, uh, which is the quotient of X by G. Um, and uh, this, this universal property says that uh, there exists some map L tilde, which uh, goes from this quotient space from the orbits to Y, and uh, in such a way that this diagram commutes. So such that L is the same as uh, taking the quotient and then applying this map L tilde. That sounds quite abstract, but we can look at an example uh, with image classification. So um, if, if we want to classify these images here into different categories, like uh, we, we have images of lizards and they appear in different rotations and we have images of something like these butterflies, which appear in different rotations. Uh, and then we want to learn a map which uh, says, okay, these are all lizards independent from the group action. Um, and uh, the, these here should be all butterflies independent from the rotation. This is a rotation invariant map. Uh, 
and the theorem tells us uh, that um, if we have such an invariant map, uh, there exists actually, um, we always have this quotient map here, which takes images in our image space and uh, clusters them together into orbits. And the orbit would now be the set of all images which are related by rotations. And then we have another map, L tilde, which goes from these orbits, from these sets of images which relate by rotation into the label space. And this is, uh, yeah, the, the pictorial way of, of uh, understanding application of this uh, universal property. And uh, this also explains to you why invariant models are more parameter efficient. Since if we have a non-invariant model, which uh, should classify um, all these images here, it could in principle learn something uh, different, like say, okay, and that's a lizard, but this here is a butterfly, and then we have uh, something else here. So it's a really big hypothesis space, but if our if, if we have an invariant model, it cannot give different labels to these different guys, since it's equivalent to something which classifies this whole orbit of images in exactly the same way. This is the application uh, which, which I'm working on a lot. Okay, now um, equivariant maps, um, they have a group action both on the domain X and on the codomain Y of uh, the function. So, um, yeah, we have this uh, map L going from X to Y. We have a group action uh, triangle X and a group action triangle Y mapping or acting on X and Y. And uh, the map L is G equivariant if it commutes with these two group actions. So uh, in the diagram, first acting in X with G and then mapping via L should be the same as uh, first mapping via L and then acting in the codomain uh, on Y. And uh, as an example, um, we could uh, look at uh, SO2 rotations uh, around a projection axis in R3. So let's say we have R vectors in R3, and uh, as a group action uh, in R3, we look at uh, rotations around the z-axis. And um, then we have a projection map, which goes down the z-axis, and uh, we end up with uh, a two-dimensional space, the xy plane. And then we can also look at the group action, which are rotations of the xy plane. And uh, these two, um, yeah, this, this projection commutes with these uh, two group actions. So uh, intuitively, if you rotate in three dimensions and then project it down, it's the same as first projecting down and then rotating. So that's an example of an equivariant map, this projection. And uh, you could actually check it by uh, seeing that uh, multiplying these matrices as on the left or on the right is uh, the same. So this is our projection map. This is uh, our group action in uh, R3. And this is our group action in uh, R2, and uh, they commute in this way. So uh, the projection is an equivariant map. But again, something more uh, pictorial. Um, if we don't only want to classify uh, that there is something dangerous in our luggage, um, but we want to identify or segment which object it is, um, then this is actually permutation equivariant. Since uh, if you permute your objects in your input, you get a corresponding, or you want to have a corresponding permutation in your output. So you have a permutation action in your input and in your output. Um, yeah, convolutions are uh, the classical example of equivariant maps in deep learning, um, where the convolution should uh, commute uh, with your translation action. And uh, we can actually look at why that is the case. So if you have the convolution map, it takes uh, square integrable functions on, let's say we just do it in uh, one dimension. So we have L2 of R, which are functions on the real line. It maps functions to functions, and it does so by doing this convolution integral here. And uh, if we want to check that this is uh, really an equivariant map, we have to take the convolution of a shifted function, and then we do all these steps, and in the end it comes out, this is the same as first convolving and then shifting. And uh, I will, slowly go through this now. So if we have the convolution of a shifted function, we can write out as this here, that's just the definition of a convolution, where we have here now instead of f, we have the uh, g acting on f inside. And um, if we write this out, uh, the g action on f, the shifted function, that is just f of y minus g. And um, then here we can substitute this y minus g defined as z, uh, and then we have to replace this y by uh, z minus g or something like that. Um, and then you see that this uh, corresponds actually again to a convolution, but now the argument here is x minus g. So we get the convolution of k and f uh, with output argument x minus g, 
So uh, we have a translation of our convolution result. In this way, we prove that convolutions are translation equivariant. And uh, yeah, what I'm working on is uh, not only translation equivariant convolutions, but convolutions which commute with other group actions, like what happens if you are rotating your picture or if, if you are reflecting your image, something like that. And uh, yeah, for, for instance, this includes isometries. This is what uh, is most useful in practice. And uh, we generalized this even to um, isometry equivariant convolutions on manifolds. So then we would perform a convolution on, on the surface of some manifold. And uh, this convolution operation should again uh, commute with the isometry action of that manifold. Um, yeah, it, it sounded a bit like that invariance and equivariance are two separate properties, but uh, they actually relate in certain ways, such that invariant maps are a special case of equivariant maps. And also, equivariant maps are, in a certain sense, invariants, um, which is what I want to show here. Uh, so if we look at this uh, diagram of an invariant map on the left, uh, we can act at this uh, identity morphism here, which always exists, and uh, yeah, just acts by doing nothing, so we can add it everywhere. Um, but if, if you inflate it here, you see that um, an invariant map is an equivariant map which the, uh, with the uh, trivial action in the output space. So it's just a special case, and if we want to design uh, group invariant machine learning models, we can just uh, develop equivariant models, and then this uh, pops out automatically as a special case. And uh, then the relation in the other direction is that uh, an equivariant map is itself an invariant under the group action. Uh, and to see this, uh, we can start here with this definition of an equivariant map in the first line, and then uh, multiply over the uh, group action uh, in Y to the other side. And this defines you a group action actually on the space of functions which map from X to Y. So it says that uh, this, fun this equivariant function L is invariant under simultaneously acting from the left and from the right with the uh, group actions in the domain and codomain. And yeah, it's, it's invariant, so it doesn't uh, change if we do that operation. Mm. So equivariant maps are themselves invariants. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, yeah, that has big consequences uh, for geometric deep learning. Since if you build an equivariant neural network, uh, it will always in some sense have an invariant uh, neural connectivity. Uh, so for instance, um, here, uh, this, this is a weight matrix of a multi-layer perceptron. Uh, which has a certain permutation equivariant structure. And then you see that uh, the um, weight matrix itself is invariant under uh, permutations on the input and output. This is on, on X and Y. So we would uh, simultaneously uh, permute rows and columns, which are the input and output spaces. And if you, you see, if you have such a green block here and uh, you shift it, uh, permute it to another uh, column, then you would get a different matrix, but if at the same time you also permute uh, in the same way your rows, then uh, this thing is invariant under it. So you will always have these uh, invariance patterns in your neural connectivity. And the other example um, here is uh, weight sharing. So if, if you have a convolution that's translation equivariant, and if you demand translation equivariance, uh, you get weight sharing, or in this case, uh, what we proved uh, on manifolds is that um, if you want to have a convolution operation which is equivariant with respect to rotations of your manifold in this case or any other isometry then uh, the kernel field or the neural connectivity which you apply has to be invariant under this group action so this uh, yeah really has a big uh, impact on on equivariant deep learning okay and then uh, to connect this to equivariant neural networks um, a feed-forward neural network is just a sequence of layers. So we have feature spaces F0 to Fn, and you have layers which map between them. And uh, if we want to design an equivariant neural network, uh, then we just have a uh, sequence of equivariant layers. So each layer uh, gets this, or each feature space, F0 gets, uh, for instance, a group action uh, triangle 0, F1 gets triangle 1, and so on. Each feature space has its own group action, and each layer is equivariant. So this is such a small square here. But then if you uh, stack all these layers uh, together, they will give uh, one big equivariant map. 
And uh, if you want to build an invariant neural network, what we are usually doing is uh, we first build an equivariant network up to a certain depth. Then we do some uh, invariant map. And uh, then after that, we can just apply uh, some, yeah, some, some uh, generic MLP or whatever on uh, these invariants. And uh, the best example for that is the convolutional network. If you want to classify, first you have your convolution operations, uh, which are translation equivariant. Then at some point we do a global pooling operation, which is translation invariant, and then we apply MLPs on top. Yeah. So, so G is the it's actually the same element that just belongs into a different representation of the same group yeah. on the different feature space that you obtain. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's a very important point. So if, if you have an uh, equivariant map, then it's always the same group element. But uh, it's a different action on different spaces, but always the same group element which is acting. Yeah, that's important to understand. Yeah. Do you define the convolution or is it many books? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need it for a smooth shape. If the shape is not so smooth, you can consider the shape you put it that you want, or you have to uh, make assumptions in the shape you have to find next to the equivalence. Yeah, um, so your convolution operation should always respect the structure of your manifold, the mathematical structure. And um, if you're talking about smoothness, uh, you need to consider a smooth manifold. So for instance, if you have just a topological manifold without a smooth structure, uh, you can't talk about smoothness. But uh, we are looking at Riemannian manifolds, uh, which are actually smooth. And in addition, uh, they have a Riemannian metric and these structures should be uh, respected. But uh, I will talk about it on uh, Wednesday, I think. Yeah. And I will uh, introduce many folds later today. All right, uh, I will come to representation theory, but uh, how much time do I have left for that? Uh, we start 10 minutes later, so I, I will mm -hmm. say thanks for class 10, 34 minutes. So I will... Oh, great, okay. Yeah. Since we still have more talks and... Uh, I, I will anyway stop at some point since uh, okay. there's some point where it gets so too abstract and scheduled for uh, 5 p.m. So if you stop at 5 p.m. Oh, I guess I will stop earlier. We have another block, yeah, but we have uh, multiple talks still. So. Stop earlier, I guess nobody will complain. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so too. <laughs> yeah, um, as I said, uh, representation theory uh, plays plays a big role uh, since. Um, uh, these are um, or, or describes uh, linear actions on vector spaces, and it plays in particular a big role in uh, physics. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, spins or angular momenta, uh, these are rotation group uh, representations. And maybe if, if you're a physicist, you learned in quantum mechanics about angular momentum coupling, and uh, it looked very mysterious that uh, somehow you you sum angular momentum L and S, and then you get out all angular momentum from with indices going from L minus S to L plus S. No one told you why. And that's actually a Klebsch Gordon decomposition. So this all follows from representation theory. If you want to understand what is going on, you have to study representation theory. And uh, yeah, for, for us, it's interesting since uh, we want to build equivariant networks. And uh, these feature spaces are usually um, vector spaces. And uh, they are equipped with a linear group action. So these are representation spaces. Uh, which have a group action on them. And, um, and then we are looking here at uh, equivariant maps between representation spaces, um, which are called intertwiners if they are linear. And well, the nonlinearities are not intertwiners, but also equivariant maps. Okay, so um, a group representation um, is kind of modeling group elements or group actions uh, as matrices or linear operators, if you take it a little bit more abstract. Um, and they act on vector spaces. And uh, the definition is just that, uh, yeah, a linear group representation of some group G on a real vector space Rn is a group homomorphism. So it respects the group structure. Uh, and it's a homomorphism from G into the uh, group GL Rn. So the uh, n by n real valued uh, invertible matrices. And, uh, yeah, a homomorphism satisfies uh, this composition property here. This was uh, the definition that rho of GA, 
h is the same as uh, rho of g times rho of h. And here on the left, we have the group composition, which uh, composes g and h. And on the right, we have matrix multiplication, right? Since we take group elements and map them to matrices, and then we model this uh, group composition with matrix multiplication. This is the idea of uh, group representations. Um, and in particular, uh, since they are homomorphisms, um, it follows that rho of G inverse is just, uh, well, rho of the inverse group element is uh, the inverse matrix of rho of G, and uh, rho of the identity is just the identity matrix. And uh, this is actually just uh, the, a very special case which I introduced here. So we looked at uh, real vector spaces Rn and uh, the general linear group of Rn and matrix multiplication. But uh, to, to have it a bit more general, uh, we could take any vector space and um, yeah, any vector space V and then the general linear group of it is just the uh, group of uh, linear maps to itself, which are invertible. And uh, instead of matrix multiplication, you just have a composition of uh, linear maps. But just think about mapping to matrices. I think this is uh, good for your intuition. So some examples for SO2. Um, maybe first this, this what I call defining representation, since uh, SO2 is itself a matrix group. And then we can take a group element G and represent it by itself. Uh, so it's just this rotation matrix itself. Um, but uh, we could also have the trivial representation, which exists for uh, any group. And um, yeah, it's, it's mapped from the group to uh, one by one matrices. Uh, and it just maps each group element to the identity. And then, uh, yeah, the homomorphism property is satisfied since if you have two group elements and you multiply them, you get two times the identity. If you multiply them again, you get uh, also the identity. So it's a homomorphism. And you see some structure can get lost in this homomorphism. Um, then uh, irreducible representations uh, of SO2 would be these uh, rotation matrices with a higher frequency. So if you rotate by an angle alpha or phi, then uh, these matrices would rotate by uh, k times phi. Um, yeah, and another example would be uh, tensor rep representations, where you just take the tensor product of two matrices and you get some four by four matrix out. But again, it's some group representation. So in general, we are mapping group elements to matrices, which kind of model this uh, or are consistent with the group composition law. OK, if you have a, a group representation, you can restrict it to a representation of a subgroup. So um, let's say uh, we, we have uh, these rotation matrices here of SO2. Uh, and then as a subgroup of SO2, we have uh, discrete rotations by 90 degrees or multiples of 90 degrees. And then we just take uh, these matrices. And instead of plugging in any angle, we just plug in these 90 degree or multiples of 90 degrees. And uh, yeah, we get a representation of our subgroup. And that's called a restricted representation. Uh, and the restriction functor is a forgetful functor. So it does nothing but just forgetting the full structure and applying to the subgroup only. And um, one example where this is interesting is uh, we are working on uh, equivariant networks, which are not only translation, but also, let's say, rotation equivariant. And uh, this is obviously useful if you have something like a microscopy image, uh, which on a global scale can be rotated and still uh, looks like a microscopy image. But if you, if you have something like, like such a natural image, uh, you always have the sky on the top and uh, yeah, the, the horizon is always horizontal. Um, so maybe you don't want to have uh, full uh, rotation equivariance, but only translation equivariance. But at the same time, you see that um, these sunflowers, uh, they are in some sense uh, rotationally symmetric. So these features appear in different rotations. So on a local scale, we want to have rotation equivariance. But on a global scale, we don't want to have it. And then we can build models which are first uh, equivariant with respect to, uh, let's say, rotations and translations in this first block here of the neural network. Then we can take these uh, features at that point, which are G representations, and we can restrict them to H representations. And then we just go on with where, where H is a subgroup, and then we can go on with an H equivariant CNN. So first we have a first part of our neural network, which is rotation and translation equivariant. Then we restrict only to translations, and then we have a translation equivariant network part. That would be one application of that. Um, 
Another uh, thing you can do with uh, representations are direct sums. Um, and yeah, if, if you take uh, two vector spaces, so let's first look at vector spaces before we get to representations. If you have two vector spaces, V and W, then uh, you can think uh, about the direct sum of V and W as, as kind of stacking these vectors. So you take a vector V and you take a vector W and you just put them into one long vector V direct sum W. And uh, you can do the same with uh, group representations, uh, which also then act, uh, yeah, if, if you have a group representation uh, row one acting on V1, and you have a group representation row two on V2, then uh, you get a direct sum representation, row one plus row two, which acts on the direct sum of vector spaces V1 plus V2, in such a way that uh, basically that the direct sum of representation representations acts on the direct sum of vectors just by acting on the inv individual components independently. And um, yeah, if, if you have matrix uh, representations, then uh, this stacking of vectors corresponds to um, also stacking these representation matrices into blocks of a block diagonal matrix. So um, for instance, if we have this uh, rotation matrix here, uh, which is a two by two matrix. And then we have this uh, trivial representation, this one by one matrix with just one in it. We take the direct sum, we get a three by three matrix, which has um, a two by two block and then a block in the bottom right, which is one by one. And uh, this again gives you a direct sum, sum representation. And um, yeah, these two subspaces, like the subspace, the XY plane, which uh, rotates under rotations, and the z-axis, they transform independently. They are not mixed by these uh, two representations. So the direct sum always uh, combines two representations in such a way that the representation space you get uh, is bigger, but uh, these two components transform completely independently from each other. And um, yeah, you could use this for uh, an equivariant neural, neural network. So for instance, an SO2 equivariant uh, MLP. Uh, which is processing a batch or a direct sum of vectors in R2. So you have these two dimensional vectors, and then you can just stack them all into uh, one big vector, but uh, each vector is being acted on by its own two by two rotation matrix. So um, yeah, you can uh, combine representations uh, with the direct sum operation, but you could also combine them with the tensor product operation. and um, Again, we have uh, two representations, row one and row two on V1 and V2. And this tensor product uh, representation now acts uh, on, on the space V1 tensor V2. So we are acting on a tensor product of vector spaces. And uh, we are acting in such a way that, again, just the tensor product representation acts on a tensor V1 tensor V2 as row one acting on V1 and row two acting on V2. And then after that, taking the tensor product. And actually, you can't write any not, not every tensor can be written this way, but uh, like general tensors follow by linear continuation of this map. Um, yeah, and if you have the matrix representation, then uh, it's just the Kronecker product of these uh, representation matrices. Um, yeah, may, maybe as an example, um, if you have uh, such such features uh, where, like in the first example, you have a permutation uh, of, of elements of a vector. Um, and uh, this is, for instance, useful if you have uh, something like a graph neural network. And uh, in this, this first vector would, would be a vector where each element corresponds uh, to a node of this graph. And then we are looking at permutations of nodes, which would uh, permute these features in this vector. Uh, yeah, this is this, this first vector. But uh, if we are looking at, as, at something uh, like, like the adjacency matrix, uh, this has kind of vector indices uh, in its rows and in its columns. And then if you permute something, you are at the same time permuting rows and columns. And the simultaneous permutation of rows and columns is just the tensor product of uh, what we had before. So G tensor G is acting on it. And uh, if you have something, a tensor, which is labeled by, uh, let's say, three node indices, I don't know why you would use it, but uh, maybe you could do it, then um, you would have this uh, tensor product G tensor G tensor G acting on that thing. Yeah, and then um, if you have group representations, uh, we can again look at uh, equivariant maps. And um, 
if we are looking at linear equivariant maps between group representations, they are called intertwiners. Um, it is just what you saw before, only that uh, our group action is now uh, a group representation on a vector space, and our map is, in addition, uh, required to be linear. And uh, yeah, as I said multiple times before already, um, these are kind of the main building blocks of uh, equivariant neural networks. For instance, the convolution, this example, is, convolution is linear, and uh, it's translation equivariant, and uh, therefore it's a translation intertwiner, actually. It's not only an equivariant map, but it's a linear equivariant map, so it's an intertwiner. And uh, the other example here is, uh, yeah, what we already saw before, um, an equivariant permutation equivariant uh, MLP, where uh, the feature vector spaces are representation spaces and uh, the weight matrices are then linear operations, so they are intertwiners. Okay, so at that point, uh, I thought uh, we can either go on and introduce stuff like irreducible representations, uh, isomorphic representations, uh, Schur's lemma, and so on, but uh, maybe I guess that's a good point to stop. <laughs>